You're listening to the OCD Stories podcast, hosted by me, Stuart Ralph. The OCD Stories is a podcast dedicated to raising awareness and understanding around obsessive compulsive symptoms. I do this through interviewing inspired therapists, psychologists, and people who have experienced OCD. Welcome to the OCD Stories. And welcome to episode 378. And in this one, I got back on Eva Stepney. Eva is a research student studying for her PhD at the University of Sheffield. She's looking at the history of OCD. And in our last episode, which was titled Guilty Obsessions, we take a look at the history of that around guilt in OCD. And in this episode, I got back on to talk about the history of intrusive thoughts, why we use the term, where it came from, um, it's a really interesting view and perspective from Eva. And thank you to NoCD for supporting the podcast. NoCD offers effective and convenient therapy available in the US and outside the US. To find out more about NoCD, their therapy plans, if they currently take your insurance, or to download their free app, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories, or the link will be in the episode description. Thank you to all of our patrons for supporting our work. This podcast episode is available as a video recording on our Patreon. To sign up to our Patreon and to check out the other benefits you'll receive as a patron, please see the link in the show notes. And thank you to Eva for her time. I found this discussion interesting. And of course, thank you to you guys for listening. As always, it means a lot. And without further ado, here is Eva. Welcome back to the show, Eva. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's good to have you on. And obviously, we talked about guilty obsessions last time, and I'll link to that episode. And um, but for those that haven't heard that, just a bit of background on who you are and your perspective on OCD, or like where, where you're studying it. Sorry, yeah. how you're studying it, I should say. Yeah. yeah. So, I'm a PhD student at the University of Sheffield, and I am looking at the kind of historical construction of OCD as a psychological category in like the latter half of the 20th century so I look at the kind of shift from psychoanalytic understandings of obsessions and rituals um and how they were kind of assembled in a new way by clinical psychologists in Britain and what that can tell us about kind of psychological conceptions of the mind more broadly um so yeah I come from a historical perspective um and I also have my own experience with obsessions um and compulsions and that has kind of informed my research journey i suppose yeah yeah thank you and uh, and i think it's relevant just to to summarize the guilty obsessions episode if we really boiled it down was freud sigmund freud obviously talked about guilt well guilt being the thing that separates ocd from say phobias and then mm-hmm. the psychiatric community removed guilt and i guess other emotions like disgust and shame and it just became about anxiety and then in recent years we've gone full circle back to what freud said that guilt is actually a part of it yeah definitely so i I kind of looked at how anxiety was a more measurable affect or a more measurable experience in in psychiatry but also in behavioral psychology um so that's kind of why it was centralized um in kind of Um, understandings of compulsive behavior um Mm. yeah and now I'm actually thinking about the cognitive behavioral model and I'm trying to um pass what responsibility means in that and how responsibility as kind of a schema actually links to to guilt so Mm. yeah it's all it's all coming full circle (laughs) interesting yeah um so I'm sure we can do an episode on that in the future uh so Um, what I want to talk what we want to talk about today or I want you to talk about is the history of intrusive thoughts so this is something you've been thinking about and researching and exploring Um, Mm -hmm. so I guess very broadly to start us off what is the history of intrusive thoughts um well (laughs) I suppose I don't look at the history of intrusive thoughts in and of themselves Mm. I do a little bit but I but I'm using that history in order to kind of understand how we got to obsessions as intrusive thoughts so I think um on one of your recent episodes the what is OCD episode Mm. with um Jonathan Hoffman and Katja Moritz Moritz, yeah um I think Jonathan was talking was saying you know uh we have this concept of intrusive thoughts and I don't really understand or like he didn't really relate to it that much because aren't all thoughts intrusive um and I'd actually been having the same 
thinking process myself and um, my supervisor who um, isn't an OCD specialist but is a historian had pulled me up on it once you know why do you use the term intrusive thoughts um like what where does that come from like aren't all thoughts intrusive I was like yeah um so I yeah I began looking through kind of psychological and psychiatric literature in the US and the UK so English um text written in English and the kind of the the idea of intrusive thoughts as an actual symptom I traced to the work of this guy Marty Horowitz who um was a psychiatrist in America who was working with uh soldiers who had come back from the Vietnam War who were experiencing a lot of uh what we'd now understand as as trauma but wasn't conceptualized as trauma yeah um but we're experiencing like highly kind of stress related repetitive images and thoughts and so he's he this psychiatrist who's working with these soldiers is the kind of first person to use this symptom of intrusive thoughts um and i think he formulates that symptom based on kind of early trauma research so Freud talks about kind of repetition compulsion of memory and um, you have texts from the First World War that talk about memories and thoughts being thrust into consciousness, um, you know, after somebody has experienced conflict. So I think this idea of kind of things being thrust into consciousness got observed in trauma research and then picked up by this psychiatrist, if that makes sense. Mm. It does, yeah. (laughs) Uh Yeah. Okay. So I guess that's like the initial, the initial. Yeah. Part yeah. Of. Okay. And then where did it lead you from there or where did it filter into OCD? Yeah. So, I mean, this is quite a large chapter of my thesis, so I, I'm not going to be able to explain it all, but hopefully mm-hmm. I'll give kind of a sense of, yeah. of how it became relevant and, so basically this work was going on in America with with soldiers who were experiencing stress and um, Horowitz, this psychiatrist, was saying things, you know, that intrusive thoughts would would due to people being unable to process the memories of, of war. And so, um, you know, this people get stuck in these like cycles of repetitiveness as they're trying to like process these particularly traumatic memories and, you know, the stressful thoughts come from that. Um, and the PTSD diagnosis gets developed in 1980. And um, uh, Horowitz is on the task force that develops that. So so intrusive thoughts appears in the diagnostic manual for PTSD um, mm-hmm. as like a symptom. So then in British clinical psychology, you have Stanley Rachman, who's many, many, I'm sure most of your uh listeners who work clinically will know who Rachman is because he's um a very well he's he passed away last year unfortunately but he's the big the big cheese um (laughs) in developing the OCD model that we understand today um and so he was working in the 1970s and behavior therapies were having problems at this time because you know you have the anti-psychiatrist saying oh behavior therapies are so controlling and and you have a problem with like obsessional, um, you have a problem with obsessional patients who they'll be doing exposures in the hospital, but when they leave the hospital to go home, um, they're relapsing and all these psychologists, so Rachman and his colleagues are getting very frustrated with behavior therapy. Um, and so they decide like, okay, so maybe we've been focusing too much on behaviors, too much on compulsions. So let's start thinking about like what obsessions are. Because up to this point, like compulsions had really, really been the focus. Um, so, and and in the kind of behavioral model of of obsessions and compulsions, obsessions were just harmful stimuli that produced like a behavioral response. So it was very functional. But he thought, you know, perhaps we can understand what's going wrong in behavior therapy if we actually start to consider like obsessions and consider, you know, what these things are in their entirety. So at the same time, he goes to America and he goes to California (laughs) and he um, becomes more enmeshed in the research going on in America, the stuff that's going on with PTSD and so on. Um, So when he comes back to the UK, he thinks perhaps 
we can explore obsessions through the lens of intrusive thoughts, through the lens of this symptom of intrusive thoughts that's developed in relation to trauma, because he thinks, you know, there are some similarities, both are repetitive, both cause distress, and so on. So he kind of, yeah, he kind of uses intrusive thoughts as a, as a lens through which to think about obsessions, but in doing that, over time, the two concepts kind of get merged. Hmm. Um, I mean, this is a very kind of uh, stripped back for <laughs> way of explaining it. But um, yeah, Rackman draws on the research and intrusive thoughts to understand obsessions. Yeah. Uh, do you want to ask another question? Or do you... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm happy for you to keep going on that if you are. But I guess something that comes to my mind is what's interesting now is intrusive thoughts, in my opinion, in OCD pop culture, is way more dominant than the word obsessions. Yeah, yeah. right? Hmm. Um... Even in the last five years, I've seen that change. You know, when I got into advocacy like eight years ago, it was intrusive thoughts was there but it wasn't it was like a smaller thing and now the narrative is intrusive thoughts obsessions the smaller thing that's how I see it anyway yeah and it's strange because there was at this period that I'm looking at in the 1970s and 80s obsessions are described as intrusive thoughts but they're not the same thing it's like Mm. the intrusive quality is a way of describing the obsession rather than and yeah, I mean, I agree with you in the sense that people talk about intrusive thoughts all the time now, even even not in relation to OCD, even in relation to low mood yeah. or anxiety. It's it's suddenly uh, yeah. And I, I wonder whether that's because of the expansion of trauma, be, right, yeah. more, perhaps more than an expansion of awareness of OCD. Yeah, um, I think it's because we also get all of us get kind of weird and wacky thoughts and maybe the general public think, Oh yeah, that happens to me. And then that's, I think there's that TikTok trend that actually is really bad because it actually, it, it describes intrusive thoughts, not necessarily as a bad thing, which I think is then going to have a negative effect on people with OCD. I don't quite get the trend, but from what I've heard about it, um, yeah. I don't know if you've seen that people no, talking about their intrusive thoughts when they don't have OCD and it's, yeah. Yeah. But, but I guess that kind of links to this conceptual problem of mm. intrusive thoughts being, aren't all thoughts intrusive? Yeah. As in the sense that like thoughts just come into our mind and what do we mean? Because when you, when, when people have an obsessional thought or a thought that becomes obsessional, It's not necessarily that the thought itself is more intrusive. It's that you perceive it to be more intrusive, right? Mm. I'm not, yeah, I'm not quite sure. I think what's what's in my mind at the minute is, yeah, with this whole aren't aren't all thoughts intrusive, you're probably right. Um, And the intrusive word is maybe just a descriptor we give to thoughts we don't like. So if I suddenly think, oh, tonight I'm going to have that cake that I'm I'm not really a cake person but let's say I am that cake I really fancy eating that's a nice thought for me but it's still intrusive it's still come out of nowhere into my head popped up yeah it's like nightmares for me my view is that's just a word we give to dreams we don't like yeah yeah maybe there's a difference I don't know but in my head there isn't it's just it's a scary dream they're still dreams they just have like a different effect yeah quality yeah, and this idea of kind of normal obsessions or normal intrusive thoughts is also something that I cover in this chapter because that actually comes from psychologists like Rachman and others oh. in the UK deciding that they don't like the psychiatric medical model. So they don't like this idea that people have illnesses and those illnesses are equivalent to physical abnormalities and stuff. And so they start saying instead of illnesses, we need to talk about everything being on a spectrum of normality Mm. and when they make that jump they then decide okay so if we work with normal subjects and we work with normal um yeah normal people in our experiments then we can still learn about the pathological mind because everybody's on a spectrum so this Mm. is when they start conducting experiments with 
normal people and asking them about particular thoughts and then determining that oh wait these people have the same kinds of thoughts as the psychiatric patients we've been dealing with for years Mm. Um, and that's when they start developing this idea of like okay so everybody has obsessional thoughts everybody has thoughts that has the same content Um, and then they think okay so if everyone has the same thoughts what makes those thoughts different for obsessional people or for Mm. people who are kind of pathologically obsessional rather than just the normal population Um, and that's when they also then start thinking about like okay let's let's start questioning how these thoughts are experienced let's start questioning their effective quality their duration the level of discomfort they cause and they just begin asking different questions yeah was it yeah in terms of treatment like um uh, icbt inference-based cognitive behavioral therapy I uh, mm-hmm. did an episode on it recently where they're, they're saying it's the, the the inferential confusion around the thought coming in that causes the doubt. Or oh, sorry, that is the doubt. But that that's the issue right there. And that's, yeah, I'm still getting my head around it. But that's why we all have these intrusive thoughts, but it's some of OCD. It's this error in thinking almost that causes, uh, I don't think they call it an error in thinking. That's just because i haven't got my head around it whereas erp might say no it's because there's an emotional charge there like anxiety or guilt Mm -hmm. and that's why it's sticking and it's interesting you say that because the period that i where intrusive thoughts becomes uh, a a new a new and kind of big concept is before cognitive psychology has really made its mark Mm. in british clinical psychology at least so things like inferential models and cognitive models of yeah maladaptive reasoning and so on they weren't used to explain um obsessions and compulsions like that they hadn't become a thing yet it was it was at this point the level of discomfort caused or like the experience of the thought was what made it pathological um and it's quite interesting because when Rachman starts trying to understand obsessions through the lens of intrusive thoughts, which, yeah, as I said, was the symptom that had kind of emerged in this trauma-based research. Um, He then extrapolates from that and suggests that perhaps obsessions as a symptom are the result of unprocessed memory. Mm. And And it's kind of, it was interesting reading that because that, whole narrative has been completely lost and and he he abandons it as well later but at this point before cognitive explanations he he's thinking about oh perhaps people do experience obsessions because they have unprocessed memories and perhaps you know the obsessions are or Mm -hmm. or the intrusive thoughts are a symptom of that yeah interesting so he later discarded that again right yeah so he goes to the states and he moves to the states and kind of starts he he becomes interested in in trauma research more generally but salkovskis kind of takes up the the reins in the uk and goes down the cognitive behavioral route okay. yeah uh, but but he takes the definition of obsessions as unwanted intrusive thoughts developed by rackman as his starting point so he takes mm. like definitional elements, which is why they're intrusive thoughts, because even, yeah. Okay. Even the- but I think with intrusive thoughts, what is interesting is the term has helped a lot of people, right? Because it has helped. And this is why Stephen Phillipson coined Puro in 1988, I think it was, um, because there are all these people coming to him that that didn't have – the usual type of OCD that had no obvious physical compulsions. And I think intrusive thoughts does help that population of OCD sufferers. So I think it has been a good term um, overall. Yeah, yeah, no, I I agree. And I've definitely never had a problem with the term, but I wonder Mm. whether in what way it differs from obsessions in that regard would do you think obsessions would be as useful because you could still have puro 
if you just talk about obsessional thoughts or do you do you think it's because obsessional thoughts has too much of a a colloquial element you know that that people talk about being obsessed when they're not talking about something pathological if you if yeah you know. no I get what you mean it's not something I sat down and thought through so I'm speaking out loud here um so no one hold me to whatever I say but um I don't know I quite like obsessions because it, I get what you're saying like people say I'm so obsessed about cheesecake or I'm so obsessed about my nails or you know I don't know why I'm using these examples but um I don't I bite my nails so I don't really have anything to be obsessed about but yeah I think when if I think about my own OCD obsession relates much more than intrusive thought the yeah, intrusive thoughts that have been there but the obsession is I can't get this out of my head I can't stop thinking about this there's too many questions I am literally obsessed about this whatever it is this worry um I always have viewed intrusive thoughts as like the starting point and then we get obsessed over them you know so it's almost like the initial thought um and then we we ruminate we overthink about it and that's where the obsessional quality comes in but yeah yeah I don't know what's your thought on that um I think I don't know it's been I think intrusive thoughts yeah has been very helpful in just making distinguishing that this kind of experience is is different from just like a normal obsession that maybe it's it's content or something makes it feel more intrusive than yeah. if I was just thinking about a pen for example if I, if I was like obsessing about a pen then mm. um, I wouldn't label that like intrusive yeah I think it's because it, it feels jarring there's something about the kind of intrusive quality that that is that is jarring which I think yeah. I found helpful but I think that's because I've struggled more with plastic intrusive thoughts than mm. for example, obsessions around contamination or yeah which could which can be on like a broader spectrum, I think, of of how jarring they are or how. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And I think, um, but in my mind, you can also be like, so let's say someone, you know, or yourself previously, like getting lots of uh, intrusive thoughts and being bombarded by it. There's still a quality of you can't stop thinking about them. So not just coming to you, you're now obsessing over them. Why are they here that, you know, I don't want them here. They're scaring me. Da, da, da. That is the obsessional bit. And for me, that is the OCD because that is then the cycle. Um, so in, in terms of four is, I think, really, really useful. But I think it's the big, at least speaking out loud, it's the beginning point to obsession. And because it's so really... scary, it fuels obsession, you know? Yeah. And this is so interesting because, and this is why, yeah, this is why it's so interesting doing a historical mm. account because what, you pinpointed as the kind of OCD bit there was the kind of evaluative thinking, right? Mm -hmm. And at this point in time, that's not yet like a conceptual framework. So mm -hmm. people like Rachman in the 70s are treating patients with obsessions without having the framework that we understand today to be OCD. Mm -hmm. So they don't have like a concept of cognitive reasoning or cognitive evaluation as causing intrusive thoughts like that was Salkovskis so that kind of came in like the 19, 1985 I think hmm. so it's yeah it's just really interesting that they're grappling with these experiences using a completely different language um hmm. yet some of that language we've kept and some of it we've okay. we've discarded um hmm. like in in this when he, when Rachman starts thinking about intrusive thoughts he he conducts all these experiments with um with mothers um from who work at the Maudsley and Bethlehem hospitals where he works. Um and he gets a group of mothers together, half of them, their children are going in for a tonsil operation, and half of them aren't. And they he gets these mothers to to record their thoughts, like before the operation, um, on the day of the operation, then after the operation. And then he also does things like play them music. And then whilst they're listening to music at different pitches, we'll suddenly throw in words like tonsil, blood, and so on. Mm. 
um, to try and work out whether the intrusiveness of a particular word um, can be measured. So if you can hear tonsil whilst music is really high, then you're perceiving that as more intrusive. Does that make sense? I think so. Whereas like... Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the volume that you can hear a particular word yeah. or like in in comparison with a particular pitch of music means that your experiencing is more intrusive. Yeah. So hmm. for, the, for the mothers who, who are particularly stressed about their children going into hospital, they hear those words um, more clearly even when the words are really, really quiet and the music's really, really loud. Um, and so he he will say, you know, that's because they're stressed, they're experiencing these these um, words as more in, as more intrusive. Mm. Um, so he would say, with obsessionals, the reason that they hit experience the same thoughts as more intrusive is perhaps because they're like you know stressed about something else. Yeah. Um, I yeah. don't know. It's just it's just strange that there's this whole kind of conceptual world that he's he's part of. And yet we've kind of kept this idea of intrusive thoughts whilst like removing it from that conceptual world hmm. yeah it's fascinating that's yeah. why history is important it's, it's important to study it and understand it because to really understand why we are the way we are where we are um and i also find it fascinating how he I mean, this is how you made it sound like he just kind of went to the States, to California, and then suddenly he almost like it by coincidence, he's studying with this PTSD researcher. And um, and if that was the kind of case, like there was a lot of luck involved, oh, then yeah. we are the way we are today because only because of luck. His hard work as well, don't get me wrong, but because of coincidence and luck, you know, and serendipity. Serendipity? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it is or synchronicity. I, think. synchronicity. I don't know. Yeah, one of the two. I don't words. Know. I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, all these things. I think yeah, when you kind of dig down into the history of it, you're like, oh wow, these things are just mm. almost by accident. Um, yeah. Or divine they... intervention, if we. Yeah, or divine intervention. That's very true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even when you look at the history of kind of cognitive behavioral therapy and the way that the cognitive model of depression started getting explored at like, the, the Department of Psychiatry in Oxford and picked up by people like Salkovsky. You realise, you know, it's just these these really specific connections of, you know, somebody getting hold of a cognitive therapy manual for depression and being like, hmm, maybe this is interesting. And then, and these, I don't know, just small steps that have suddenly got us to this kind of understanding of OCD and this understanding of like psychic distress that we have. Mm. Um, yeah, and I think that's nice. when, when I heard um, uh, of that on the last thing on uh, Jonathan Hoffman <laughs> um, saying about yeah, I don't understand why it's intrusive. It suddenly sparked. Wow, mm. I cannot understand, but <laughs> or yeah. tried to understand, and it's quite yeah. random. Maybe I'll share this episode with him. Get his, get his thoughts. Um, yeah. yeah, although I feel like every, everything is kind of much, is explained in much more detail in my chapter, which is about 16,000 words because mm. I'm able to go through like all the different steps, whereas yeah. I've not really been able to, it, it's hard to, to say all these things in like yeah. a conversational manner. Course, yeah. Well, if when if and when when you've published, you know, or, or published or like passed your PhD, um, if you ever want to share it, I can always add a link in the show notes of this episode. Just let me know. Um, no, definitely. Uh, um, we've probably um, so I should say for anyone listening, uh, Eva sent me like um, an abstract of what we're talking about today. And I've, I've pulled some stuff from it. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the sentences I pulled from that abstract was the notion that obsessions were normal prompted Rackman to inquire into experiential factors, duration, level of discomfort, feelings of unwantedness, etc., in order to mark the pathological aspects of obsessions observed in the clinic. Now we have, we have talked about this, right? You've kind of already alluded to it. Um, and just anything else you want to say on that? 
Um, I mean, one of the kind of contextual factors for the for the um, idea of obsessions as, as normal, so one of the kind of precursors to it, is also that um, psychologists don't have legal access to working with patients at this time. They have to; they're only allowed to work with patients in psychiatric hospitals when they've got given consent by psychiatrists, and that this means that they don't actually have. Um, a big subject population to work with. So this is another, as well as the kind of rejection of the medical model and the shift towards kind of a spectrum of normalcy in their in their actual kind of thinking, in their conceptual or in their conception of what psychic distress is. Um, they, yeah, they um, don't have access to psychiatric patients. So this means that it's a lot easier for them to actually conduct experiments with like the normal population. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I said earlier that um when they start when Rackman started thinking about what obsessions were he he gave a list of um obsessional thoughts drawn from psychiatric case notes to 124 norm, normal people and asked them to put a mark next to the the thoughts that they'd experienced before and i think 99 of them i can't remember the exact figure had, of the 124 had experienced um the thoughts that had been drawn from the psychiatric case notes um and then he then got like so this is Rachman and also somebody called Padma de Silva so I, I ought to mention him because mm. he's quite an um, important person in the history of OCD but um they write down kind of different thoughts on based off these 124 normal subjects and and based off eight um, psychiatric people who've been diagnosed with obsessional problems, um, they get them to write their their, um, thoughts on uh, different cards and then give them these cards to nurses and ask the nurses to try and say, if these ones are from the obsessional patient, these ones are from the normal patients, I mean, from the normal people and the, the nurses can't. So they say, okay, well, we can't uh, discriminate between an obsessional and non-obsessional thoughts on the basis of content. So let's try and work out what what makes a thought pathological. Mm-hmm. And this is when they start turning to um, rate discomfort ratings, you know, conducting this experiment with the normal people, with the obsessional. This is also where ego dystonic comes in because they they also they notice in these experiments that the normals will say, oh, I don't find this thought kind of ethically problematic, but I know it is by like some people's standards. You know, they'll start saying these things. And then so they also determine, okay, well, the obsessionals seem to find their thoughts more kind of ethically controversial than the normal people do, even though the thoughts are the same. So this is kind of the the what I label like the turn to experience in psychology which has also has a broader history in psychedelic research and other stuff going on in the, kind of the Californian hippieism going on in the UK where they start developing measures to actually account yeah. for experience. Um, yeah, sorry. If that no, that's, <laughs> it, no that's, that's interesting. <laughs> I think the whole ego dystonic thing is important in OCD that it's, yeah, it's, this is ego dystonic for me. I don't like this. This is scary, but I don't think that fully answers it because I have intrusive thoughts sometimes, well, obviously all the time, because all thoughts are intrusive, but in this almost stereotypical sense, but they're not part of my OCD, but they're intrusive. So I could be driving, a ro- driving down the road and my brain goes, oh, what happens if you run this person off the road? Mm. And and I don't like that. It's egodystonic in that I would never do it because it's against yeah. my value system. But sometimes I'm like, that's hilarious. And I actually enjoy the thought. I find it funny. But it is yeah. egodystonic still, you yeah. know? Whereas with an OCD, if that was my theme, I wouldn't find it funny. It would just be egodystonic. I'd find it scary. So there's something else going on in... And that, mm. I think that's where like inference, inference-based CBT comes in of it's the doubt. It's our... It's the inferential confusion that's the problem here, you know? So I'm like, oh, this is kind of funny, this intrusive thought, even though I'd never do it. Whereas when I have OCD, I'm looking at different evidence, if that makes sense. Like, and then that's what's scaring me. And could I do it, you know? When when I don't have OCD, I'm I'm 100% confident I'd never do that, which is why I can find the thought funny. Mm 
or yeah. relevant. Yeah, and I think this is why this particular kind of period of research doesn't, although it although it influences the description that we have of obsessional thoughts as unwanted, mm-hmm. intrusive, ego, dystonic, it doesn't add that kind of explanatory mm-hmm. level, which is why when cognitive therapies and cognitive models um come along they 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 find that way into ocd because they're like okay we have the experience but it doesn't really explain why Mm. patients like some patients become obsessed by particular thoughts yeah Um, interesting and I think yeah. that's where ICBT can say, yeah, it's the doubt. That's the difference in my example. And then ERP could be like, well, that's the emotional charge. So when I'm driving yeah. down the road and I get that intrusive support, <clears throat> there's no emotional charge. So I can just laugh at it and be like, oh, that's a funny thought. Whereas when I have OCD and the emotional charge is there, no, I can't laugh at that. It's, mm. yeah. Yeah. Horrible. And it's one of the things that's quite strange about the history that for, you know, 20 odd years psychologists were trying to understand obsessions and compulsions through a behavioral lens so obviously the compulsions make sense through a behavioral lens but the idea that you can understand obsessions through behavior is something that's quite like alien to people who or to us now because we do see that kind of rationalization is so fundamental um but it just didn't it just wasn't like seen it wasn't seen as relevant for <laughs> quite a few decades. <laughs> yeah. True. <laughs> because you know, obsessions are just the stimuli and it's the response that matters. Yeah. Which yeah, is why exposure. Yeah, exposure is such a a key treat yeah, a key a key element of treatment and why mm. sometimes it isn't super effective with people who are very kind of cognitively oriented (laughs) yeah it's interesting and i think what's coming to my mind as well is just thinking of history again which is obviously your your area how this is all history right but how you know if we think about the uk it's very nhs led and the research very university led as it is everywhere i guess but um it really depends who is high up in the NHS or who is high up in those universities. For example, Sokovskis, Paul Sokovskis, how after yeah, he um he obviously had his view and he led the charge and now we adopt that way largely because of him. But if it had been someone else in power, so to speak, maybe they would have taken a different view of Rackman's work or had their own ideas and we would be talking in completely different terms and ways so it's it's just fascinating how it's not even necessarily the truth with anything it's just who decides the truth and if they can get it over the line with enough evidence and conviction it becomes reality yeah exactly and also the importance of evidence in like evidence-based medicine in the 90s Mm. you know becoming a big thing and and evidence becoming more of a a defining feature of kind of um the 80s you know and with with kind of um the conservatism of margaret thatcher and stuff and wanting you know more outcome oriented and Mm -hmm. um it just happened that at this particular time this form of therapy actually fit with the broader direction of society and the broader kind of way in which healthcare was was going and yeah and that's not to say it's it's wrong or bad it's just that it's important to remember that things could have been different um like things can always be different um and and it's all yeah I mean Rachman moved to the states in 1983 and like I don't know but from Mm. from a lot of my reading it, it seems that one of the reasons he did move was because of the rigidness of the NHS and not it didn't allow you to be more exploratory it was so outcome focused and it was all about producing concepts that enable you to intervene therapeutically in like a very specific way. And mm. I think he was a bit bit more theoretically minded. Okay. Yeah. Well, but, the NHS is still like that, right? And not, that's not an insult, hopefully, but it just saying it is, it's probably got more worse than Rackman's time of being, 
uh, you know, we're thinking about IAPT and that whole movement in 2007 or whenever it was and CBT becoming almost the complete dominant therapy. And obviously I'm pro it, but I'm also a big fan of other therapies yeah. and that's still legacy to this day. Um, is that a good thing? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But I don't, I don't, yeah. It happened, yeah. 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 And yeah. I think it's it's one of the reasons that OCD is quite a, a stable diagnosis, I think, as in it's, it's not a contest. You have some diagnoses that are very heavily contested. Yeah. Um, but OCD isn't, and I think that's probably because mm. of it being quite well institutionalized through IAP. Yeah, true. Because it, it's more, it's more has different levels of understanding in the states, doesn't it? There are kind of more competing theories. Yes, yeah. In US research, but in UK, yeah, the it's... UK less so. And you got the nice guidelines that clearly lay out everything. This is how you treat it. Da, 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 da. And look, obviously, ERP, in my opinion, should be a big part of most people's mm-hmm. treatment. Um, absolutely but it's like erp medication they kind of mention cbt in the cognitive sense but not in a big way i don't think and then there's nothing else i don't think you know as other like depression i think the nice guidelines have different therapies they list or at least it might at least be to, an alternative to cbt they list and obviously they're going based on what they see purely in the research which you could argue that's what they should be doing yeah but if you're not researching other things, how do you know how effective it is? Yeah, exactly. You know? And yeah. psychologists in Britain at least put a lot of effort into um, stating that, you know, psychoanalysis was harmful and mm. the forms of therapy were harmful to OCD or to obsessions. And um, Yeah, and traditional psychoanalysis probably was. Yeah. Mm. But it's changed. So we can't make that claim without the research, in my opinion, yeah. now. You know, I'm not saying it works. I'm just saying if we're going to be evidence based, let's have some evidence to say it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um Yeah. Yeah. But that's my my issue with research and evidence based <laughs> talk. I mean I've, yeah. I've got lots of issues, but I'll I'll, I'll come back to them. Aside from OCD. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like pro city. But yeah, I'm I'm very interested in kind of evidence based psychotherapy as a concept. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I will I will come back to you on that once I've written yeah good. about it in the final parts of my. Good, I look forward to hearing it. Um, cool. So I guess lastly is, is I'm, uh, there's so much to ask you about this, but I'm still getting my head around it. So. It, so I don't have any questions is what I'm saying. So is there anything else you would want to share on this topic? Another aspect that kind of led to this um, uh, turn to experience in clinical psychology and away from kind of purely behavioral models was that the kind of two stage theory of fear and avoidance, which had been developed by Herbert Maurer in the 1930s and which underpinned a lot of behavior therapy, including exposure and response prevention. Um, was being seen became kind of ther- theoretically problematic because the idea was that you know uh there were two stages to kind of uh to fear you had, you have like an initial response and then you have a behavior which reinforces the fear um and in kind of clinical settings rackman and other people were noticing that when obsessional patients often they their their fear decreased so they go through exposure um treatment and their actual levels of fear in regard to a particular stimulus would decrease yet they were still engaging in behaviors and this was like so i think rachman said he had a patient with checking compulsions who just carried on checking for 10 years even though they didn't have any fear about anything and so um because of this, they were like, okay, well, the two-stage theory, which says that fear and behavior reinforce each other, can't be true because this guy is doing the behavior without without the fear. Um, so this is when they start kind of thinking about fear as like, okay, perhaps it's not just behavioral. Perhaps it's also emotional. Perhaps it's also experiential. Perhaps it's physiological and perhaps it's behavioral. So they start kind of, rather than fear just being this very mechanical thing, it's like fear is this thing that's made up of different components. And that kind of new theoretical framework opened the way for 
paying more attention to the way that people talked about the emotions that they actually had in regards to particular symptoms rather than just you know psychologists observing what was happening and not actually talking to patients Mm -hmm. um so I think that that's another kind of big shift that happened during this period that kind of opened up Rachman's conceptual landscape and and kind of made him start exploring these different pathways and ideas of getting people to talk about discomfort and unwantedness. And, and that's how we got to this idea of in, intrusive thoughts as unwanted and so on, because he was paying attention to what people said about their thoughts rather than just mm. observing their behaviors and having that be enough. That's interesting. Yeah, it's really a good bit of history. Sorry, and, uh, I, I didn't say that in like one sentence. <laughs> no, I, I like that. Um, and well, yeah, so I also like when we can give credit to people who can never come on the podcast for obvious reasons because they're not here anymore, uh, at least physically. Um, so it's nice to kind of, yeah, honor their name. So thank you for sharing Rackman's work and the other people you've mentioned whose name I'm unfortunately I've already forgot. There's um, many. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so look, thank you for coming on again and and sharing your historical view of OCD. I personally find it really fascinating. And I know the Guilty Obsessions episode, people at least that reached out to me, um, really resonated with it or liked it and found it interesting. So um Hopefully they find this one interesting and us kind of thinking out loud interesting. Yeah, I, I hope so too. And um yeah. I'm I'm glad to share some historical insights. <laughs> and thank you so much for having me. And yeah. Thanks for all your hard work with this podcast and stuff. Thank you for listening to this week's podcast. And thank you to our Patreons who helped make this episode possible. And if you would like to find out more about Patreon and the rewards and benefits, then there will be a link in the episode description. If you enjoy the OCD Stories podcast and would like to support us with a one-time tip slash donation, please go to theocdstories.com forward slash support. All tips, no matter how large or small, are greatly appreciated. Please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to the podcast. And thank you to NoCD for supporting our work. If you want to find out more about NoCD, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the episode description. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. And until we speak, take care.